Okay, so <clears throat> welcome everybody. I'm Helmut Hofer, faculty member at the School of Mathematics. It is a great pleasure to introduce to you Richard Hain. Richard is since uh, 1991 a professor of mathematics at, at Duke University. His research interests are in geometry and topology. Currently, he is a member at IS and one of the core participants of the topical program on topology of algebraic varieties, which takes place this year in the School of Mathematics. So the School of Mathematics basically every year sponsors a concentrated activity bringing uh, together the top people in the field. And a large number of impressive mathematical discoveries have come this way. Richard has made important contributions to his field of research, which touches on problems in number theory as well as the geometry of spaces and their symmetry groups. Now, Richard is not only a top researcher, but also an extremely good citizen. From 2009 to 2014, he was the director of the IIS Park City Mathematics Institute, PCMI. Now, PCMI is a very interesting outreach program of the School of Mathematics. It is a program of professional development for the mathematical community, but mathematical community here in a very broad sense. It includes research mathematicians, graduate students, undergraduate students, mathematics education researchers, undergraduate faculty, and mathemat mathematics teachers. It first was held in uh, 1991, so it's approaching its 25th year. As you will see, this is a very unique program, and um, we know from actually studying it, it has really a non-trivial impact uh, in mathematics on all levels. So let's give the floor to Richard for his presentation. <clears throat> Thank you for the very kind introduction. Um, so it's a great pleasure to, and an honor to give this lecture to the friends of the IAS. And I also understand that I'm the friends member of the Institute. So I'm also very grateful for the support from the friends of the IAS. So my job is to tell you ab what about PCMI. And when people ask me uh, about PCMI, I say uh, describing it is very difficult. PCMI is like a platypus. <laughs> so, so why is PCMI like a platypus? Well, let's discuss it. So when the Europeans first came to Australia, well, actually the English, they, after a few years, they found platypuses, or platypi, and they have a duck's bill, a beaver tail, otter's feet, they have fur, they're mammals, but they lay eggs. <laughs> and so they took samples back to uh, Europe, and people could not, they could imagine all the parts, but they could not understand how they fitted together. So it's the same challenge with PCMI. I'm going to describe to you the pieces, but it's the non-trivial task is describing how they fit together. But the whole is truly greater than the sum of the parts. So uh, actually, I should say I put this picture in here because I really like it. I have no idea. So this is a participant at PCMI, perhaps last year, I don't know, or this current year. And uh, I have no idea which program she belongs to. But what I like about this picture is she's totally absorbed in mathematics. Here she is just standing out in the corridor, thinking about some problem, drawing on a whiteboard. So anyway, let me see what I want to say about. Um. So um, PCMI is a three-week summer program. It's held each July in Park City, Utah. And it has. As Helmut said, it has parallel and interacting programs for teachers, students, and researchers. And typically, there are 300 people there. Most people are there for three weeks. All the major programs run three weeks. We run a few one-week programs, and the researchers are there for between one and three weeks. Uh, let me just. And so the goal of PCMI is to promote mathematics research and is to, re to improve mathematics education at every level, from for graduate students, undergraduates, and in schools. So, so let me talk about the first part. Um, so 
So the first part of PCMI is the teacher program. So, uh, so most of the participants in the teacher program are what I'll call battle-hardened mathematics teachers. Most of them are high school teachers. Originally, they were all high school teachers. We spread to middle school teachers. And for some reason, we now have, that I may explain, we now have elementary school teachers as well, just a few. They are quite diverse. They come from urban schools, suburban schools, public schools, private schools. Some have PhDs in mathematics. And I believe some have no college mathematics. And you may ask why they're there. This is a very high quality program. But they share one thing in common. Um, they are all very dedicated. First of all, for them to come to Park City for three weeks in the summer requires a lot of commitment. But I mean, you can see from the pictures, they're all incredibly engaged. And they have a difficult program. They start at 8.15 in the morning, and they run till, well, the formal part of the program runs to about 3 o'clock in the afternoon. But they typically have supplementary stuff afternoon that can run into the evening. And they do this for three weeks. Um, so I'll describe, I like to describe the program as, as flypaper for dedicated and talented mathematics teachers. You know, if you want to find really good teachers, this is a way to find them. They, they come. We don't have to go and recruit them. They come. Um, and the goal is to develop teachers who have become teacher leaders at, at their schools. And you want t as many teacher leaders as you can in all the schools of the country, preferably one, at, one in every school or at least one in every school. So that's the goal. And um, another goal of the program is to professionalize teachers. I mean, I, am, I stay clear of this. I have, I have my own opinions, and I won't voice those. But I think being a teacher in any subject now is difficult. Um, you read the newspaper. There are op-eds, say, in the New York Times that, uh, where people are saying, this, teachers should do this, or teachers should be, do that, or how can we get rid of teachers, and so on. But um, everybody else wants to tell them what to do, and many of those people have never taught in a school. So they don't even know what the reality is like. And I'll say a little bit more about that later on. Um, so their program has three parts. The first part is about understanding mathematics. So one thing all these people have in common, even those ones with very little mathematical background, is that they love mathematics. And even some that haven't had much formal training are actually extremely good. And I can, I'll give you evidence of that later on. Um, and so the first thing they do in the day, it runs from 8.15 to, I think, um, 10.45, is they have the morning math. And this is a math course. And so the, let's see if I've got another picture. Yeah, I'll flip back to this one. There's approximately 60 teachers, ranges from roughly 60 to 70. Uh, there are tables of six. At every table, there's an empty chair, so visitors can come and observe, but they aren't allowed to interfere. So at each table, the teachers are quite diverse. So they don't put all the PhD teachers at one table and all the elementary school teachers at another table. They mix them all up. And so in this setting, all the teachers are actually students. And there are the people that run this program. Uh, I never knew how good teachers could be until I saw people running this program. But what they're doing is teaching a really heterogeneous group of teachers. You know, they're high school teachers, middle school teachers, elementary teachers. And they, like I said, they come from all kinds of schools. But they're able to teach them all at the same time. But part of that, these teachers are learning how to teach really heterogeneous classrooms in a very effective way. And so um, what else do I want to say here? So they do problem sets. And I, we, we are finally getting around to publishing these. And I have two here. They're not published yet. These are the pre-publication version. If you want to look at them, they're highly non-trivial. And they have three kinds of problems. So you may say, how do you handle uh, such a heterogeneous audience? Well, there are three kinds of problems. Some are called important stuff. So everybody has to do the important problems. Because there's, there's a theme that runs over three weeks. And after three weeks, they really get somewhere. Somewhere really non-trivial. Even for a graduate student, it's non-trivial. They really do something. They really learn some non-trivial mathematics. 
Um, there's also neat stuff, so the better students or the better teachers, the ones that are more mathematically advanced, can do the neat stuff, which is, goes beyond the basic stuff. And for those that are really good, they can do what they call the tough stuff. And if you look in here, their problems are classified into those three uh, types. <coughs> um, I know very, very good mathematicians, I'll name one, Ingrid Dolbeshees, who've gone in there for 10 minutes, become addicted, and come back the next day and done the entire hour and a half. <laughs> and do all the problems. I mean, because, and they're non trivial, even for, you know, it's embarrassing sometimes to go in and try to do these problems. They're not easy. And so, um, so I'll say a little more about the book uh, because I want to also talk about the people who develop it. But there's a long history here that I won't go into. But other than to say there was a program at Ohio State University called the Ross Program, the outgrowth of that is now run out of BU and it's called Promise. That's an acronym for something. Um, there are people at B. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> Sorry. Um, and somehow the people at BU spawned a company which is called EDC. It's in Boston, and that's another um, TLA, three letter acronym. Um, and so they prepare a preliminary draft of the, of the materials that are used in this course that you find in this book. Then there are two people that are key, and one of them is Daryl. I, I don't have a picture of the other. The other's Bo, and he's an employee of EDC. But I want to tell you about this guy here. He's, he's one of the exceptional staff people that work in this program. So he is a professor of mathematics at Harvey Mudd. But he came to PCMI first in another program I'll talk about later, which is called the Undergraduate Faculty Program. He got interested in the teacher program, so he became interested in education. So this is a kind of interaction that you get. At, this is part of the glue of PCMI that I'll talk about later on. So he has been committed to education. Let me give you a couple of examples. Well, first of all, he, every day they do this program. They have the draft of these problem sets. They make the problem set. According to where they got to and how it went, they completely redesign the next day's work. They revise all that. And they type it all up, and it's ready the next day. So they basically stay up all night. And so, and this progresses for three weeks. So that's dedication enough. But um, he's dedicated enough to education that a few years ago he had a sabbatical. And so what did he do on his sabbatical? So did he go to Hawaii or did he go to another university? Did he take a vacation? No. There was a short window in California when anybody who had the technical qualifications could teach in a high school. And he arranged to teach in an urban LA high school. In fact, I believe it's the one where they filmed Glee. And nobody at the school knew, not even the principal, other than one other teacher. And he taught there as a highly qualified professional mathematician who's an extremely good teacher. And uh, he blogged about it anonymously. Apparently, it was quite a popular blog. But I'll get, he spoke about it at PCMI as one of these cross-program activities. Uh, a few years ago. But for example, the first day he turned up to teach, no students turned up in the classroom because the scheduling was so poor. The next day, he had a room full of students, but they were all there for a different subject from what, than what he was supposed to teach. You know, it was mathematics, but it was a different kind of mathematics. Anyway, um, he is also, you may have read about the flipped classroom. This is a very fashionable thing for people to talk about where for example, if I were teaching you, I would videotape my lecture, put it on the web, you were supposed to watch it, and then you come to class and we do problems. And it's quite a good idea, but a lot of people are writing about this, including certain New York Times op-ed contributors. And they're saying every classroom should be like this and so on, but really they don't know. They've never tried it. They've not, never done it themselves. Well, it's a, an NSF-funded project to determine whether it really works, and Daryl's one of the PIs. Right, so he's really committed to mathematics education. The second thing the teachers do is reflect on practice. So there are many aspects to being a good teacher. The first is you should know the subject, morning math. The second thing is you need to understand pedagogy. You can know all the mathematics, but you can't deliver it. And you also, knowing the pedagogy is not enough. You need to know the mathematics. So they do this for another hour and a half before lunch. And um, 
the philosophy behind teacher education at Park City is it's very pragmatic. This program, I was told, you know, we're running 25 years now. It took them, this is probably a modest statement, it took them 10 years to get it right, to find the right model, which is the current model, 10 years to perfect that, and now it's running very well, right? So, and it's very pragmatic. It's informed by certain research in mathematical education, but if something doesn't work, they, they change and adapt. I'd also like to tell you about this guy here. So this is people in the reflecting on practice. Um, one job I tried to do when I was at Park City is get more underrepresented minorities there. And I, we were trying to get students into the undergraduate program. But as a result of sort of contact with people in, say, historically black colleges, we ended up getting recruits to different programs. And this guy comes from Greensboro, North Carolina. So a lot of, and he was a student at NC, North Carolina A&T. And so these universities train a lot of teachers. This guy is exceptionally good. And because of contact with this community, this guy was able to come to PCMI for two years. And he is an exceptional teacher. He's teaching in urban schools in Greensboro. He's also wearing a Duke sweatshirt, if you notice. That's <laughs> nothing to do with me. Um, in the afternoon, I have no, these pictures are taken by a professional photographer. They don't know what to take pictures of. So they took no pictures at, at the afternoon session. But the third thing the teachers do, and this is in line with professionalizing them, is that they prepare materials. And for the last couple of years, they've been fleshing out parts of the common core math standards. So they're writing materials that other people can use. But a goal of the program is that teachers should be professionalized. They should run their own profession, so they should write the materials. They shouldn't be written by some company somewhere selling, you know, textbook manufacturer. They should be written by people, battle-hardened teachers for other teachers, and they should talk to each other about it. And that's what they're doing. And why is this guy here? He's actually an Australian. <laughs> But that's Bill McCallum. He was the primary author of the Common Core Math Standards. And he's at University of Arizona. And he is, there's a cabal of very good mathematicians who are very good, com very committed to mathematics education. And Bill is one of them. And so there are various people trying to keep Common Core on the right track. And, uh, you know, part of the goal is to have the teachers implement it. And this is sort of a program where we can mentor them in writing materials that can be used by other people. And they're also meant, some of them actually go out and use PCMI style professional development to train teachers. So we actually have a contract with the state of Idaho, or we don't. There's a, a group of people around Bill McCallum, but many of the people involved come from PCMI. So the next piece, and maybe the biggest piece, is the graduate program. So there's roughly 80 graduate students, and <coughs> the, the Every year there is a research theme, and it's determined four or five years in advance. Organizers are selected, and they run the graduate program and the research program. They're related programs. Yeah, and the graduate students, the way we bring them in now, they're not first year graduate students, they're typically, they've had a year or two of graduate school, so that they already have a good basis in their field. They have um, three lectures a day for three weeks. So it's a pretty tough schedule, and uh, that's five, more or less five days a week. The lecturers are all top people in the field. Um, the researchers, who I'll talk about later, uh, also come because often the diversity of the set of lectures is so great that nobody is an expert in all aspects of their own field. So they come so that you can see some of the older looking students there are probably researchers. Um, uh, yes, and the second show and tell is every year the lectures from the graduate program are published as a book by the American Math Society. So this increases the impact of the program. So these programs are usually very good, and the one, they're all forward-looking, meaning you don't take a subject that's sort of dying off and you just do a review of the subject. You try to pick a subject that is reasonably mature, but where there's lots of opportunity for future work. You produce a book, and this book is a great, you know, it's basically all the lectures appear in this book, so it's a great resource for other people, whether they're at PCMI or not. 
and see what's next. Um, an important part of the graduate program are the TA sessions. And um, to tell you the truth, we only perfected this in the last few years. In fact, the year that Rafe was uh, running it. And you see, it's great because the TAs aren't lecturing. All the students are sitting there doing problems. This is another shot. I mean, they're just, uh, we'll flip back there. They, <clears throat> you know, the students are really engaged, which is what you want to see. It means they're learning something. Okay, the next program, so we've gotten through the tail and the, the, the bill, right? So um, now the webbed feet. So um, the undergraduate has a program has about uh, typically 40 students. They take two, they only do two courses. Each course runs three weeks and they do two lectures a day. They also have problem sessions. But they, the, the whole structure of PCMI is set up so that uh, some of the teachers, if they want, can take one of the undergraduate courses. The undergraduates, if they're really gung-ho, they can take some of the graduate courses. Um, and there's the undergraduate faculty program. Those people are able to go to the other programs. The, the schedule is sort of carefully designed so that the programs do not, you know, apart from the teacher program, the, uh, the participants are able to go to the various programs and follow the lecture courses there or whatever. And the subject in the undergraduate program is the same as that of the research program. It's basically like trial graduate school for the undergraduates. They find out what it's like to be um, graduate students. Um, I put up this picture because I like it. But no, but this is a great picture. See, I like to see things happening, so intellectual things happening. And you see it in this picture. And it's a good thing this picture's high resolution, because I could zoom in on this guy's name tag there and find out what program he was in, right? So you might think these are graduate students. These are undergraduates. You know, here they are. And in case you think they're talking about the World Cup soccer, they're not. You can see that's what's on the blackboard, right? It's mathematics. Okay? And so the next program is the research program. And like I said, most researchers go to most of the graduate lectures. I chose this slide because um, the central person there, this guy here, is Tristan Riviere. He was one of the lecturers uh, in 2013. So this is from 2013. And why did I put him there? Because he was a graduate student at PCMI 20 years before. Right? And here he is as a uh, lecturer. And he stood up in his lecture and he said, he, he lectured in the first week, and he said to the graduate students here, you are incredibly lucky to be here because this was something that really helped change my life. And I actually, uh, Sandor Kovac is not here, no. But there's, a, there's at least one member here who was an undergrad, sorry, a graduate student or an undergraduate at PCMI, Sandor Kovac. Um, I'm sure there are more. In fact, several of the faculty members have been lecturers at PCMI. So that's a, they have a research seminar where, so they, not only the graduate lectures, they have a re, two research seminars a day, uh, which are open to everyone. They're available to graduate students as well. They also interact. And I picked up lots of informal discussion. And I picked this slide because the guy in the center here his name is Dylan Thurston, and I believe he's still at Columbia. Is that right? Um, his father is Bill Thurston. And you may or may not know that Bill Thurston is a very famous mathematician. And um, every year, the Clay Foundation gives us, well, generously, generously supports two really top shelf mathematicians, often of the Fields Medal. Well, they're, all, they're usually at that level, and quite a few of them have a Fields Medal. And so the year of this program, which was 2012, Bill Thurston came. And to give you, you may know about uh, Perlman, who proved this conjecture, the Poincaré conjecture, quite a few years ago. He proved a lot more. He proved a, a conjecture of Thurston. And <clears throat> uh, so what happened just before PCM, 
anyway, so Thurston, the other thing you've got to know is Thurston had a very serious cancer and he was very sick, but he, he really wanted to come to Park City and he was very active mathematically. His brain was fine, his body was dying, he had eye removed, part of his face removed and I don't know what else. And he was very weak, but every day he would come in and interact with people for a few hours. He gave a lecture. Most people could not understand what he was saying, but it was made possible because of Dylan, because he stood up there and translated. But the other significant thing that happened is Ian Agall of Berkeley had recently just resolved a lot of open questions that Thurston had raised in the 70s or the 80s. I, I believe he resolved all but one of Thurston's remaining questions, and so Agall was there at the same time as Thurston. And then Thurston died a month after PCMI. So it was tragic, but it was also uh, very appropriate that one of the founders of the field of that year's program was there, and a lot of young people could see him and interact with him. Another program that I find, oh, by the way, I forgot to show you. you can, you're welcome to look at all these books. The undergraduate program, often, sometimes they use an existing text. Other times they teach a very innovative course. And so many of the lecturers produce books. And here are examples of books that are the result of undergraduate lectures at PCMI. So this is a way of sort of expanding the impact of those programs. But I want to talk about the undergraduate faculty program, which also produces books. So this is a more recently added program. And it's small, typically 10 to 15 people. So what do these people do? So it's targeted at people interested in teaching undergraduates. And they can, can come from liberal arts colleges. They can come from state schools, whatever. But am I running over here? No. Um, so there are various models for how this, this program runs, but a typical model is that these people sit here and they try to design an undergraduate course in the research topic of the year. So this is from this last summer. The research topic was the mathematics of materials. There's no really good undergraduate material, I'm told, in this subject. So these folks are writing a book. So they, and there was a lot of interaction with the researchers. They would come in and make suggestions. They, the researchers this year were very involved with all the other programs at PCMI. But um, what will probably come out of this program is a book like this. So let me explain this book to you. There is an author here, Tom Garrity, first name, and then there's a lot of other names. So what happened here is that there was a program in a subject called algebraic geometry. And Tom Garrity, who is now part of the uh, steering committee at Park City, the PCMI, um, decided to write a book, develop an undergraduate course in algebraic geometry. There are some undergraduate texts. They're not great. But they sat down, thought about how to do it. They wrote a book. So he is the author, and all the co-authors are all the participants in the program. And that's happening with at least two other programs from recent years. So it's Maria Emilienko here is going to be the primary author. They're trying to develop this course, undergraduate course in the mathematics of materials. Um, another program that's uh, uh, is it's a one week intense program is the International Education Seminar. So this is a program. Um, more recently, just for people from six countries. The U.S. is always one country, and they pick three developed, so half the countries are developed, half are developing, half are high performing, and half are not so high performing. And by the way, that distinction is not the same. And so the idea is that the premise behind this program is that there are just common problems in how you teach mathematics across all these countries. So these are people interested in how, so typically every country provides a mathematics educator, somebody who trains teachers, and actually they have to provide a classroom teacher. So here I believe, I tried to construct the countries, I, I don't remember. US is here, Finland, which is a high performing country, Slovenia, which is high performing, South Africa, uh, China, and I don't remember which Latin American country, but there is a Latin South American country there. But that's a pretty typical mix. And 
Uh, interestingly enough, this year, the topic was, they try to align the topic, if possible, with the research program, but they make it very narrow in scope, because if you make it broad, they don't do anything. But they made it, uh, the topic was actually complex numbers as taught to high school students. And the very disturbing thing they discovered, and even the people who are experts on international education, were all surprised by this. All countries are cutting it out of the curriculum. And all of these people believe it's ba that's a bad thing to do. So it even includes Finland, which is one of the highest performing countries. Um, So this is just a shot. They, they do various things. They have a very extremely intense program. At the end of the program, they write, they write briefs on the subject. And there is some effort to put all the stuff into a book. I don't know the current status of that, but I believe it's happening. And the final program is the mentoring program I alluded to before. Is, um, I think it's, personally, I think it's very important to um, try to broaden the base of that mathematicians come from. And it's, I think it's really important to try to get more, for example, African Americans, traditionally underrepresented minorities, into mathematics. So the, uh, the goal is how do you get them at PCMI? The programs are very intense. They're difficult. You don't want to bring folks in and have them have a very bad experience. So along with several other people, we came up with an idea that um, uh, you could try to identify students, say, at historically black colleges in their first year and put them in a summer program for several years. They get involved in undergraduate research. They go to other summer programs. And maybe when they're uh, graduating, they come to PCMI as an undergraduate. So PCMI, anyone who's graduating uh, as an undergraduate is automatically an undergraduate PCMI. They're not going to be a graduate student. Um, and so we have had some success along that score, but we've actually had other successes. So all of the people in this program are interested in running programs for minority students. They either already do it or they're interested in doing it. But all of the, we've run this program now three years, and all of these people have quickly formed a network. And they've a, they're actually building programs. And I think as a result of this one, there'll be a, three of these people didn't know each other, but they're all from the DC area. And I believe they're all going to ha run a common program. So this is a great, you know, it's a, well, it depends on how you judge success. But I judge anything, you know, greater than what you put in that comes out as a success. And I believe this program has been successful. It's also the source of the um, teacher from Greensboro. And we've had various other participants as a result of these contacts. All right, so these are all the pieces. How do you put them together? The answer is glue, right? <laughs> and so. I see this as the director's job. So certain things just happen on their own. But um, I want to give some examples of how you get people to interact. So the woman in the middle is Marjorie Seneschal. She was one of the undergraduate lecturers this year. So this year's program was on the mathematics of materials. The undergraduates had lectures in discrete geometry. So for example, the geometry of crystals. And they also had um, lectures in uh, calculus of variations, more the continuous approach to materials. The other woman is Jean Taylor. And um, one thing that Marjorie did in her course was aperiodic tilings in quasicrystals. So I don't know a lot about quasicrystals, so forgive me if I make an error. But apparent, so there are ways to tile space which is not periodic, meaning the tiling does not repeat itself. And there are such tilings in three dimensions. But the interesting ones actually come from real materials. And so there is some, uh, and these are supposed to be quasi-crystals. And so there is a paper by some Japanese who determined the structure of this real, genuine quasi-crystal. You know? And it has very complicated pieces. So the goal of, these are all undergraduates in the program. Um, they actually built these pieces out of zone tools. These are these things you see there, these bits of plastic that fit together. So these are the tiles of a tiling of three space that corresponds to a genuine, a real physical quasi-crystal. And so after they made, various people helped them put it together. So here's the result. So these are the various pieces. Um, 
But anyway, it turned out to be a conversation starter. So there I am with my back to you, very rude. But people would come up and say, what the hell is this? And so these two guys are in the research program, and they want to know, what are these things? So, and there was a sheet there describing what these were and how they're put together. Um, that's, that's one way people interact. Another way, strangely enough, is lunch. So it's an intense program. This is the line, so you can tell it's good. You can see it's good, and this is what lunch looks like. But many days, people clump. They sit with people from their own program and so on. But other days, we randomize seating, and people are forced to interact with each other. Um, <clears throat> yeah, actually, there's some things I didn't say, so let me talk about the glue. There's various kinds of glue, and I don't have pictures of them, but there's mathematical type of glue. And so we have talks. For example, the clay scholars give talks to everybody. They have the extremely difficult task of giving a talk to everybody from researchers to high school school teachers or even elementary school teachers, something that everybody will get something out of. It's almost impossible, but they pull it off by and large. Um, we have panels. So for example, a couple of years ago, we had a panel on the Common Core with, for example, Bill McCallum, who was one of the authors and various people involved in the implementation of Common Core. Um, we have talks. For example, an example of a talk would be Daryl Young, who would talked about his experiences in uh, the LA school system. We also have other talks that are of more general interest. Uh, we had Robert Lang who talked about origami. And he, this is a guy that's very, you know, he's an expert on origami, but he's been used by NASA to help design, uh, what do you, what would you call them, antennae that they put in. You know, if you've got a big, big panel you want to, put on a satellite, you can't launch it in a huge panel. You have to fold it up, put it somewhere, and then it has to unfold. So he's helped NASA design these antennae uh, so they can be unfolded. George Hart, who gave, um, he's talked about 3D printing, mathematical puzzles and art, and he runs workshops on 3D printing. Um, Bathsheba Grossman, who is a real character, she is somebody who was an undergraduate in mathematics. She was a graduate student in art, and she started doing art using 3D printing starting in about 1990. You know, she knew people who had access to million. Those days, these printers used to cost $3 million. She's never owned one. You know, she knows people that will print her work. Um, she makes a living out of that. Um, we have workshops and hands-on activity, origami, 3D printing, zone tools you've seen. And then we do non-mathematical stuff. So that's why I'm mentioning this here. Um, lunch is in between. Um, I discovered, I started doing a director's hike, and I take five people from each program. And what you discover is the, it's not quite true, but it's more or less true that the fast people and the slow people are equally distributed across all programs. So if you have a hike, the rabbits, as I call them, they're all up front. There, there tends to be, undergraduates are overrepresented there. And some of the lecturers are, actually. Um, they get to talk to each other. You know, if you sit down an undergraduate with a researcher, they don't know what to talk about. But if they're walking up a trail and trying to beat each other up a mountain, you know, they'll start to talk to each other. And uh, the slow people tend to talk to each other, and so on in the middle. You have all these clumps, and they're not clumped. By, for once, they're not clumped by their program. And in fact, there you've got the organizer is um, Govan Menon. This is, this is taken last summer. He's the guy on the left on the blue shirt. One of the researchers there in the white t-shirt. You've got undergraduates. You've got some teachers there. And um, there's 3D printing. We, the first year we bought a cheap one. It wasn't a great idea. This year we bought a $2,000 one, which was great until somebody left a print job on it overnight. And it took about three days to unglue it. Um, we also, another of my innovations was uh, the PCMI World Cup. I mean, there was great concern that a few years ago that the participants were taking up too much bandwidth watching the World Cup during lectures. You know, um, so we introduced a soccer game. Again, this is another great one. You have undergraduates and everybody from lots of teachers, lots of undergraduates, but even lecturers, all playing soccer together. And believe me, some of the lecturers are as good as 
uh, some of the best soccer players there and some of the undergraduates. And if they kick each other in the shins, they're very likely to sit down at lunch the next day and talk to each other, and they do. And you can see that's the actual cup, last summer's cup there. And you can see other stuff that people have done. This origami, typically the teachers do the origami, but the materials people were really into origami. They're very interested in how materials fold. And so there was a lot of interaction with teachers there. And another thing that people do is the parade. So Park City has a 4th of July parade. There are approximately 80 entries in it. It's a very big one. The, the actual route is probably a mile long. It's sort of lined with people. There's bunting, everything. It's very, very American. And um, it's the only time I've ever been to one. <laughs> but we always have an entry, and we often typically win a prize. Everything from the top nonprofit award to sometimes specially created awards like most mathematical <laughs> or most stimulating. And uh, that's the banner from 2012. And I was in that. And as we went past the review stand, they, they announced this as geometric group therapy. <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, so the last thing is I promised in my abstract to tell you why PCMI is important. And I wrote down some reasons here. So. This is what I personally think, but I think most, many people would agree, is I think it's important that the various sections of the mathematical community talk with each other. That means mathematics students and researchers. And you say, how can they talk to each other? Well, a lot of people, including the Clay Scholars, have children. Some of them come from other countries, so they can talk about how things are in different places. Um, You know, so a lot of researchers are parents. You also have college, people who teach college students can talk to high school teachers. There's this transition issue, you know. High school teachers want to know what they should teach their students for college, and college students, you know, want to know what high school teachers are thinking. And it's very good for them to have this conversation. And there aren't very many places for them to have it. Um, Students can talk with everybody. They can talk with researchers. You know, if you take an undergraduate, they may, they've may interacted with faculty at their own university, but they actually get to see researchers in action. They may go to a research talk, not understand it, but see what people are doing. With, um, they interact with teachers. You know, we've, we've had people have come as students and have decided to go into teaching and have come back as teachers. Uh, they talk to other college professors from different universities. I mean, there's a lot of students, especially the undergraduates, tend to interact with lots of different kinds of people. Um, and that <coughs> the interactions go two ways. For students, it's both feedback to people teaching them, and also it's mentoring. I mean, faculty can mentor them. Um, for the teacher program, I think it's really important to develop a cohort of teacher leaders. And Part of professionalizing teachers is including them in the mathematical community. And that's what PCMI is doing. Um, and so I think it's also important that all these interactions go on with programs that are of very high quality. All the programs at PCMI of high quality, you take people that are very good in all these programs and they interact, and that's fantastic. You know, and, Maybe not everybody interacts, but you get enough interactions can really change things. And I'll mention Daryl Young as an example. There are others that I could dig up, but this is an example of where somebody's career path completely changed, and he's really making non-trivial contributions to education. Thank you. <laughs>